Thank you. Uh, so my name is Matthew Grayson. I'm a professor in electrical engineering uh, at Northwestern University, and I'm an experimentalist. The talk today is actually going to be a more of a theory talk uh, on material science. Um, and here's some of the uh, my group members at, at Northwestern. This work this work was published in in PRL last year. So first, an introduction to my laboratory. Um, I'm a, as an experimentalist, I do transport uh, magneto transport for electronic systems and thermal transport for thermoelectric systems with a dilution refrigerator, helium cryostat, magnet, etc. Just what you would expect. I'm not. These are the 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 experiments that I'm not going to be talking about today. Um, just to give you an overview. One of the things that we work on is novel characterization methods. So for example, we've developed a new method whereby if you have a thin, uh, a thin conducting film on top of a grounding plane, you can conduct a series of measurements and deduce the full conductivity tensor uh, by, with, with a sequence of three resistance measurements. Another recent uh, work that we've done if you have a so-called van der Pas sample and you do two measurements, the measure the resistivity in the x and y directions, sometimes you see these asymmetries in the, uh, in the response of the resistance versus magnetic field. And we've developed a, um, a characterization method that allows us to deduce the density gradient of such a sample, which is sometimes very useful for characterization of materials. We also have a novel analysis technique where if you measure experimentally some uh, longitudinal and transverse resistance in a magnetic field, you can convert that into a mobility spectrum. So here we're measuring conductivity as a function of mobility. So here, for example, we would show two different p-type species with low mobility and a single n-type species with high mobility. And this is all extracted just by inverting this data. Uh, other things that I work on are quantum systems. For example, we have coupled quantum hall edges. This is a, uh, a TEM picture of a, um, a, a we call it a, a bent quantum hull effect junction. You can see a super lattice here grown with sort of an L shape. Um, and when we apply doping to this structure, you can induce a two-dimensional electron system over this corner. And in the magnetic field, you get counter-propagating edge states. And so we observe some Luttinger liquid physics here in, in counter-propagating edge states of the quantum hull effect. So that's just an overview of the kinds of things that, I've, uh, that I work on. This particular talk is about transverse thermoelectrics, um, or what I'm calling moving heat sideways. So what are some of the advantages of a transverse thermoelectric material? Uh, I'm going to propose that one of the things it might be able to do is to um, replace a cryostat, which occupies basically your entire room, and to get cryogenic cooling on chip. Another thing it might be able to do is integrated thermal management. So imagine you, you create your computer chip, and then you, put, you lay down a thermoelectric layer. And then uh, with little thermoelectric units, you can have active cooling in your thermoelectric device to move heat uh, away from some sort of hot spot. And third, and finally, uh, another thing that we can do is with transverse thermoelectrics, you can overcome the limitations of the in intrinsic parameters of the material just by having enough of the material and just by shaping it appropriately. And you'll see a little bit more how that works in the, in the course of the talk. So I take us back to the dawn of thermoelectricity in 1911 and 1909. This is a textbook that I actually, I'm, I'm kind of proud of the fact that this book is in the Northwestern Library. Uh, 1911, a little worse for the wear. Um, so here you see, uh, so Altenkirch, Edmund Altenkirch in the Physikalitze Zeitschrift, he's, he's, um, he's citing Lord Raleigh here. So uh, it goes way back. This is the very first identification of the proper way of comparing thermoelectric materials with a so-called figure of merit where you take the square of the Seebeck coefficient and you divide by the resistivity and electrical resistivity and divide by the thermal conductivity. Superior materials will have a large ZT value, uh, which means that they'll have high Seebeck coefficient, low electrical resistivity, low thermal conductivity. 
So this has been, ever since uh, the, the dawn of the 20th century, the dawn of thermoelectrics, this has been the parameter to improve. I refer to the standard thermoelectrics, which have been the principal focus of study since the observation of thermoelectricity, um, materials whereby all of the heat currents and electrical currents are all in the same direction. So you don't have to worry really about any of these quantities as being tensor quantities. You consider them just to be scalars. These are what I call longitudinal thermoelectrics. That means that the heat flow is parallel to the electrical current flow. How can we make a device out of longitudinal thermoelectrics? Imagine you have a Fermi energy here. And imagine you have a p-doped, so this is my energy gap. This represents my p-doped semiconductor, and this is my n-doped semiconductor. And I have a certain, call it delta v, sort of a potential energy step where my holes have a higher potential energy inside of the p-doped semiconductor. My electrons have a higher potential energy when they're inside, a higher average potential energy inside of the uh, n-type semiconductor. Then if I can thermally generate an electron hole pair, if I can get the electrons to escape over here and the holes to escape over there, I will only be able to get the electrons to escape or when the electron and the hole leave, they remove that thermal energy that was, that was generated. So if I apply an electric field, it'll pull the hole to the left, it'll pull the electron to the right, and every single electron hole pair that gets generated with thermally with an energy greater than this, these barrier heights will be able to, I'll be able to remove that heat from the system. And so this is one of the primary reasons why semiconductors are such good thermoelectrics is because of this component to the thermoelectric cooling, to the Seebeck coefficient. So that's how I can cool down that central, that central um, electrode. And note that the electric field that I apply for the hole has the same sign as the electric field that I apply for the electron. So I just apply a general leftward moving electric field. It pulls the hole to the left and the electron to the right. So uh, in a device, I would have a p-type material on the left, n-type on the right, uh, send a conventional current, and the conventional current will pull electrons and holes away. So I cool down that central leg. With the transverse material, which is the reason I, I, I go through that very s simple introduction is because you'll see that things change slightly with the uh, with transverse material. I care about the resistivity in the direction my current is flowing. I care about my thermal conductivity transverse to the direction that the current is flowing because that's where I'm going to induce my thermal differential. And I need a Seebeck tensor that has an off diagonal component. So this means that if I send a current in the x direction, it will induce heat flow in the z direction. That's the essence of my transverse thermoelectric. So similarly, imagine I had, um, I want to pull heat out of a piece of metal. Then what happens is, once again, here's my Fermi energy. Um, I have a barrier for the transmission of holes, a barrier for the transmission of electrons. And so if I can firmly generate an electron hole pair in my metal, if I can pull, if I can pull my electron and, and hole out of the metal, that will cool down my piece of metal. There are several things that are profound in this statement. Notice that you can have a single leg thermoelectric now. You do not need to have two separate legs if you can pull this off. But fundamentally, notice that in order to do this, I have to pull the electron in the hole in the same direction. So I can't use an electric field in one dimension. The good news is we don't live in one dimension. We live in three dimensions. And that's going to be the advantage of how we can get uh, with this, with this a second dimension, we can sort of project out a component which we'll, we will be able to pull the electron and hole effectively to the same side. So first, let's, let's uh, review other transverse thermoelectric phenomena where electrons and holes um, get pulled off on the same side. One is the nernst eddingshausen effect. At zero magnetic field, I have a semi-metal with both electrons and holes and a conventional current. As soon as I apply a magnetic field, the Lorentz force will give a common component of the velocity to both the electrons and the holes. That will pull both electron hole pairs to one side of the device. They will recombine and give off their heat. And so I will cool off this, this when I, as I, on average, generate electron hole pairs here. They will recombine over there and I will move heat transverse to the direction of the current flow. The symmetry is broken by the magnetic field in this case to cause the electrons and holes to move to the same side.
problem is this requires a large magnetic field and you can't do this easily in a practical device. Another way of doing this is with stacked synthetic composites. So you can imagine a P-type uh, semiconductor sandwiched with a, uh, with a so-called sort of an uh, electron conducting semi-metal. Um, and if the stripes are oriented in this manner, you can get the same basic results that you can get electron hole pairs uh, to, 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 to cool off this side and heat that side. But here the problem is that these composite materials are going to be of order of millimeter thick and it's very difficult to scale this down. It's very fabrication intensive. So <coughs> what we're going to propose, what if you could have a material which was p-type along one axis and n-type along the other. What does that mean? So I draw this cartoon here. Imagine that the vertical axis was n-type and the horizontal axis was p-type. Then if it means that the electrons are only mobile, say, in the ideal case, can only move up in the up-down direction and the holes are only mobile in the left-right direction, then an interesting thing happens. Here I've broken my, my symmetry with the band structure. An interesting thing happens in the application of an electric field. The electrons try to respond to this electric field, but they can only see this component. They can only respond to this component of the applied electric field. They'll move downwards. The holes can only respond to this component of the electric field, and they'll move to the right. Now, if I have electrons moving down and holes moving to the right, the conventional, total conventional current, net current, will be up and to the right. But the particle flow, obviously, the net particle flow is down and to the right. And so here's how I have, this is the essence of what we're calling P cross N, transverse thermoelectrics, where you have a P-type and N-type behavior that are orthogonal to each other. Now this is just a concept. Um, <coughs> here's what it looks like microscopically. Imagine <coughs> you had a, some sort of thermal generation of an electron hole pair here. Then with the application of an electric field, you'll get, an, uh, you'll get a net current up and to the right. As this electron moves, uh, dif uh, drifts downwards and this hole drifts to the right, this hole will recombine with that electron and then it will give off heat to the right of your device. And so once again, this is how you have a net, uh, a net cooling effect transverse to the applied current. Okay, there's my heat flow. <coughs> now we have, because, it's, because we're fiddling with the band structure of a material, or we find the band structure of a material to have this property, we can make a device that's a centimeter by centimeter cubed. We can make a device that's one micron thick and one centimeter by centimeter square. We can make a device that's uh, one micron by one micron by one micron. So we can make an arbitrarily scalable device and there's no external B field needed because it's the band structure anisotropy that gives you this transverse effect. You don't need something like a magnetic field to break the symmetry. So here's a, um, here's a simple device. Imagine sending an, uh, Im imagine that you have a, um, this is a Savic voltage generator. Imagine you have waste heat on the bottom, and imagine you have a cooling fin on the top. So we've got a thermal gradient going downwards, so that the off-diagonal Sabet coefficient will mean that we'll, that will generate an electric field to the right. So if I then attach an electrode here and here, I will generate a voltage. And so I could use this for waste heat recovery uh, with n a normal heat flow away from a surface can generate a transverse voltage. Um, the reason that might be advantageous is because let's say I'm dealing with waste heat from a human body or something like this. I rub my hands together, I've got a little bit of heat. Um, once again, with these materials, whatever you're, you, you can always use, ge you, there's always a geometric solution to scale up your power issues. So if I have more material, then even though I have a very small thermal gradient generating a fairly small electric field, I can add that electric field to another device with the same temperature gradient and add that to another device. So I can add these in series. I can create an arbitrarily large Savic voltage, even though I have a very small, just a few degrees Celsius. If I have a sufficiently large amount of this material, I could have a kilovolt 
of, of, uh, of, of voltage generated just from a few degrees of waste body heat. What about, um, so instead of Seebeck generation, the, the, uh, the, the conjugate to that in thermoelectrics is a refrigerator. Imagine if I send a current through here, that'll pull heat downward, so then I would uh, be able to cool down this top plate. <coughs> then an interesting thing happens here, <coughs> once again, through geometric shaping. <coughs> if the bottom plate, where I'm doing my thermal rejection, uh, has, a, has a larger area than the layers above it, you have, in this so-called exponentially tapered cooler, you can actually get to arbitrarily low temperatures. So, whereas uh, if you have a, if, if in the standard thermoelectrics, this, this effectively acts like a cascaded structure, um, but it's a cascaded structure built out of a single piece. If I were to try to do this with a standard thermoelectric, <coughs> I would have a, a whole bunch of PN, PN junctions that would make a certain surface area, and then I would stack on top of that a smaller area of, of thermoelectric junctions and a smaller and a smaller one, and so you would have this pyramid effect, and that's a lot of fabrication and a lot of different pieces and a lot of soldering things together and getting thermally, uh, thermally conducting electrically isolating layers on top of each other, and here you replace all of that intensive fabrication with just taking a chunk of material and going snip, snip, and you're done and you get to arbitrarily low temperatures um, with sufficient volumes of, of material. And there are completely, um, there's other devices you can imagine which have no analog whatsoever in standard thermoelectrics. So here's my P cross N material. Imagine I have this dimple which is cut out and imagine this is the orientation of my, of my P cross N uh, Seebeck uh, effect. Then any current that's traveling in the vertical direction would have a heat flow in the opposite direction as the conventional current. Any current that's traveling in the horizontal direction would have a conventional current that has the same sign as the heat current. And so if I have this dimple, and if I have, say, a, an electrode in the central electrode on the bottom and an annular electrode on the top, and I just send a conventional current from the inner electrode to the annulus on, on the outside, the heat flow which will be orthogonal at, these, at, at the 45 degrees and co-parallel and anti-parallel on the sides and bottom respectively, you see that the heat is always being pulled away from this central node. So we call this a, um, we call this a pixel cooler, for example. So imagine, imagine you have an infrared camera and you make this uh, one micron by one micron and then you, you put your infrared element in here and then you flow this current through it and you can cool down every single pixel of your camera individually. So you, once again, you can have integrated thermoelectric solutions to, um, to uh, cooling problems that can be scaled arbitrarily small. So um, what remains, I'm gonna, so to talk about the, I'm gonna talk about how, how does one go about getting such a, uh, the equations for, for, for getting such a material so that you can see how we can, um, what, what do we look for in the band structure if we want to simulate such a material or create such a material. So if we have a Seebeck tensor that is uh, n-type for the conduction band and p-type for the valence band, the Seebeck tensor is notoriously isotropic. So these two, it's very hard to get a, a Seebeck tensor of an individual band to be anisotropic. However, um, the conductivity tensor can be a, a, can be anisotropic. So we're going to take an extreme case. Let's say that the electrons only conduct in the y direction and the holes only conduct in the x direction, which is the model that we've been discussing. Then the total Seebeck tensor being a weighted sum of those, con of, of those Seebeck coefficients weighted by the conductivities gives us exactly what we're looking for. The total Seebeck tensor with, this, with the simple tensor equation is p-type in one direction and n-type orthogonal. So. Here we have a Windows compatibility error. In brief, let's see, we have, um, we, you can define an optimal angle for, at which to, uh, to send the currents through, to de through the device. It's close to 45 degrees. You can see that if the, if you had an isotropic thermal conductivity and isotropic uh, electrical resistivity, then the square of the cosine would be one half uh, and the cosine of one over root two is 45 degrees. And so you can see that a 45 degree angle would give you your optimal cooling. Uh, 
And um, the optimal transverse figure of merit can also be calculated from those tensor components. So with the remainder of the talk, I'm going to show you uh, a way to create an artificial, uh, an artificial transverse thermoelectric from a type 2 superlattice of indium arsenide, gallium antimonide. But in general, all you need is to find a, uh, a material that has this phenomenon of having parallel n-type and p-type conduction where one of those bands is highly anisotropic so that you have a net n-type in one direction and net p-type in the other. And they do exist in nature, and I'll show that at the very end. How much time would you say? Okay. So once again, this is what we're trying to go for is to uh, have a large transverse figure of merit. Um, the material that we're studying is indium arsenide, gallium antimonide, broken gap type 2 superlattice. So here the indium arsenide has a conduction band minimum that's below the gallium antimonide. So here this, the gray region is the band gap. Here's the minimum of the conduction band. Here's the maximum of the valence band in gallium antimonide, minimum maximum. And so the electrons sit in quantum wells of the indium arsenide, whereas the holes sit in quantum wells of the gallium antimonide. The, sh the short story is that the electrons uh, have a very light mass, so they'll be able to tunnel through this material fairly easily, but the holes have a heavy mass, and they won't be able to tunnel at all. So this material, with, with appropriate doping, the out-of-plane conduction of electrons will always be uh, n-type. So out-of-plane will always be dominated by n-type. They're the only things that can move out-of-plane. In-plane, if we have appropriate doping, then the conductivity due to holes will exceed that due to electrons, and then we can have an in-plane uh, in plane p-type. So that's our goal. And so these are, these are examples of materials that can be grown of this superlattice. Um, and now, so that's, that's our uh, strategy. We're going to measure thermal conductivity of those superlattices. Um, the, the, the way this experiment works, this is called the 3-omega the method. You have a gold filament that you place on top of a semiconductor. You measure a four-point voltage. You etch away the layer of interest for one region. You apply a filament on the, on the top of the respective, uh, the etched and the unetched regions. And you basically with, so here you have, for example, here's the top view of a filament. Here's a vo uh, current contact, current contact, and two voltage contacts. And uh, here's, the, here's the corresponding one sitting on top of this thin film. Because the current will create a, uh, the current creates, uh, the current is, is sent through at a, at a frequency omega, which means that the power is oscillating at a frequency 2 omega, so there will be temperature oscillations at 2 omega, and then therefore because you have a, a thermal coefficient that's linear in temperature, you'll have, you'll have resistance fluctuations at 2 omega, and then you have your I times R voltage, so you end up with a 3 omega component of the voltage, which is proportional to the amount of heat that's escaping. So as um, if as the cycle, as, you, as you're putting power in at frequency omega, you will see a 3 omega voltage, and the larger that 3 omega volta voltage is, the more heat that you're able to get out. So you have a high thermal conductivity. If you have a small 3 omega voltage, it means that most of the heat that you're putting in is not able to, uh, is, is, is not able to conduct out. So these equations allow us to determine uh, the difference in temperature between having the thin film and not having the thin film, and that is identically the thermal conductivity of the layer of interest. So this is the thermal conductivity of our thin film, and so for our type 2 super lattice of gallium antimonide, we can see we get thermal conductivities uh, below 10 watts per meter Kelvin at room temperature. Here we're around um, 3 or 4 watts per meter Kelvin. Uh, which is much lower than the constituent materials, the in pure indium arsenide or pure gallium antimonide. And then since we've calculated that, uh, or since we've measured that experimentally, then uh, theoretically we can calculate what sort of ratio we might get for these transport parameters. And once again, this is the, the, the device that we, we simulate. We can plot as a function of super lattice width, the width of the gallium antimonide versus indium arsenide layer and we can see that we have a whole phase space of, of, of positive band gap, zero band gap, 
so-called negative band gap. This is basically a semi-metal. Um, and uh, we are interested more in this region here where we have a tunably small band gap. And that allows us to then, from band structure, we can deduce the effective mass and the energy gap uh, of both the electrons and the holes. And with all of that, um, we can deduce uh, our, our thermoelectric figure of merit, which, which gives us, when you when calculate the value of 0 0.025, we end up with a, excuse me, uh, we end up being able to get a four degree temperature difference. Now this is a four degree temperature difference that you can get from a micron thick of, of film. So this is something that you can integrate and actually make, it, make a useful device out of. Uh, if we do the exponential tapering, we can double that and get eight degrees of temperature difference. So here we have uh, the, you sort of see the, the, as a function of the, of, the, of the exponential parameter beta here, you can see that you can get more and more thermal cooling. There are also bulk materials. Here you see cesium bismuthalonide and rhenium silicide. There are bulk materials that uh, have this, this funny behavior of having being p-type in one direction and n-type in the other. So this is where I believe there's a lot of interesting material science is to explore, is to investigate related compounds that uh, have a narrow, narrow enough gap that you thermally populate both electrons and holes, but an anisotropic, some sort of non-cubic band structure that you can get um, p-type conduction in one direction, n-type in the other. So that concludes my talk. Uh, and so I'm happy to entertain any questions. Um, we're hoping that we'll be able to move forward with uh, the, the next step, of course, is to do experiments on these materials. Thanks for your attention. Somebody needs to give me some money. <laughs> is it, what, what's the challenge in the experiment? Why the challenge is, <coughs> so the way, basically, this paper that was published, people have observed this before. So we went back through the literature and we found out, you know, we, at, first, at first we thought that there would be, um, that these materials were too exotic and no one would have ever observed this because no one would have been looking for it. But then you talk to someone like Mercury Conocetus and he's like, oh, you mean like this? Boom, and he pulls out a conference proceedings paper of a material that he, that he studied five years ago, which has p-type in one direction, n-type in the other. And so we explored other, um, through the literature, and we found this behavior, it was a curiosity. People didn't really think, of it, think about it too much. It wasn't until we published our paper that, we, that, that we're, we're trying to push people to think of this as a, as a new paradigm for thermoelectrics. Now, the ZT values in these materials are very small. You saw this one was you know, 0 0.02. Um, a competitive thermoelectric nowadays is ZT, well, the standard is ZT equals 1, competitive is ZT equals 2. <clears throat> but we would like to think that given that there's been more than 100 years of research of standard thermoelectrics, and we've only had two years to investigate this paradigm, we like to think that it should be possible to find ZT equals 0.1, ZT equals 0.5, ZT equals 1, maybe even ZT equals 2, transverse thermoelectrics in the upcoming decades. Um, so that's the challenge that I pose to the material science community and the chemistry community is that um, these materials do exist. They're out there. Now we have to go back. Now that we understand they might be interesting and useful, we have to go back and we have to um, do the material science, do the simulations, do the band structure calculations, do the synthesis, and um, find out what are the best materials that have the, the properties of, yeah. Have you considered black phosphorus? Uh, What's the band gap? It's pretty small, point 0.3 EV. 0.3 EV. That could be interesting. A smaller band gap would be nice because still 0.3 EV, you, you, you want to be sort of close to the intrinsic level where you are thermally populating across the band gap, both electrons and holes. Um, but there are other, there are other geometries uh, that, that might work, but that's certainly interesting and worth exploring. Lincoln?
Well, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of studies. Uh, Mahan, for example, that with the longitudinal thermoelectrics, there are these sort of pie in the sky. What is the highest ZT that you could imagine, given certain constraints? Um, and those constraints involve uh, typical properties of crystals and typical thermal conductivities. And you know, ZT equals one is 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 kind of a, about as good as you can typically do. Um, then what happens is then people say, okay, well, let's get away from typical. Let's make super lattices. Let's put in special kinds of defects. Pardon? Is, is ZT one the same work as the theoretical? Well, once we, once we get, um, once we get, so no one's done the analysis specifically for transverse, but I would like to think that bulk materials ought to be able to do at least as good as bulk longitudinals, which would be ZT equals one. Uh, but then what happens is, of course, what you do nowadays is you throw all of nanotechnology at it and you put special phonon scatterers inside of there, phonon inclusions. Uh, you, you put uh, other sorts of, um, you put super, lattice, super lattices in there. Anything you can do that can reduce the phonon mobility while maintaining a decent electron mobility, those are the things that help boost your ZT. And nowadays, Z, ZTs approaching two uh, are, 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 are being reported. I think you'll see some more about this in the next talks. Okay, well, thank you very much.